the main Christmas staff ball that year was at Buckingham Palace, and I had arranged for an old friend to come with me. As Joe Loss and his orchestra struck up the first dance, Prince Philip approached a lady member of the staff and asked for a dance. Fergie was there with Prince Andrew, and I noticed she was coming in our direction, a broad grin on her face. As she bounced up to us, I began to introduce my guest. A look of confusion furrowed her brow. Well, who on earth are you? She barked somewhat officiously. I explained I'd looked after her at Highgrove. Oh, yeah, she replied aloofly. So you did, and walked away. <laughs> what? <laughs> I was not angry so much for myself as for my guest. Are they always that rude? He asked me. Your life must be a misery. Hello, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Cheer Denise, and today we are going to be doing several chapters from The Housekeeper's Diary. Now, these chapters, as always, are chock full of the craziest details that you have never heard, and from a completely different angle than any other book we've read, or possibly any other book you've read before if you haven't had the opportunity to read this one. We have so much to read today that I have to just get straight into it, but I do want to address one thing that came up in the comments last week. If you're one of the people who commented not liking the way Charles was depicted in those chapters or potentially the way I discussed Charles in those chapters, you're really going to like these next chapters because they really shed a beautiful light on Charles, specifically about the way he parented his boys, a warm and charming and generally lovely he was with his boys and how much he loved them and how much they knew he loved them back, which is really an important factor too when you consider the fact that Harry wants to tell you that he didn't know if his dad loved him. It's impossible that he didn't know, especially considering several of the scenes we're going to read about today. You will really enjoy the, these next chapters. They're, they're very, very illuminating. This first chapter we're going to read, it's called The Riding Instructor. It's chapter eight, and it begins this way. It says, it was a Saturday morning in early January, and after her Christmas break, the princess was in a terrific form. Diana has decided that it's the new year, and new year knew her. And she has decided that she's going to show up and she's going to be just a delight. And nobody exactly knows what's going on. Nobody knows why she's in such a good mood, but she is in a good mood. And, you know, she's just going to be a ray of sunshine. And the entire household is just breathing a sigh of relief. Like, finally, maybe these people are maturing out of this weird world of drama that they've existed in. The book says that her good friend and former flatmate, Carolyn Bartholomew, godmother to Prince Harry, had just been shown in to find the princess with no shoes on running towards her. William and Harry followed close behind, dressed in their favorite army fatigues. Both were kissed and hugged warmly by Carolyn. Turning to her friend, Diana said, Now before we get down to the good gossip, guess who else I've invited? Carolyn looked momentarily blank. David Waterhouse. You know, the army boy, silly. He should be here just before lunch. Diana was at her most buoyant and excited. It appeared that the Christmas break at Sandringham shortly before had led to some dramatic New Year's resolutions. Top of the list appeared to be a new cheerful attitude to life, and with her mind made up, her good mood was very infectious. A new year, and perhaps a new Diana, I thought, as I went to do a last-minute check of the green room where Carolyn Bartholomew would be staying. Major David Waterhouse arrived shortly before lunch in a silver Audi. William and Harry had obviously met him many times before, and were delighted at having the thick-set, real-life soldier staying for the weekend. David, William explained to his brother, used real guns and killed people. I don't think so, William, giggled Diana as the group sat down to lunch in the sitting room. Prince Charles was away for the weekend. How convenient. And having popped into Highgrove for a night alone the previous Thursday, like Diana, he seemed more relaxed and contented than I had seen him for many months. He'd slept in Diana's double bed, something he always did when she was not there, and had commented on how good the mattress was. I held my tongue, but I felt like saying that if it was so good, why didn't he sleep there when his wife was at home as well? Carolyn, who'd been to school with Diana, was one of her closest friends, and the two of them seemed inseparable. David, who was obviously a very good friend, was someone Diana relied on and bounced ideas off of. I've known David for years, she would say with a smile when we said how charming her friends were. He's such a dear, dear friend, but I suppose I must find a wife for him one of these days. Doesn't look like she was in much of a rush. All of them congregated in the kitchen shortly before midday as William and Harry finished their riding lesson with the groom, Marion Cox. The Sunday morning kitchen session became a ritual as the boys grew older. Both would come in out of breath to find Diana putting up pieces of carrot and apple on the sideboard. 
Armed with a knife each and under very close supervision, they would chop up the vegetables to feed to the guinea pigs and rabbits. Then they'd grab handfuls of sugar lumps and take them out to thank the ponies for their rides. We were not to see the prince and princess together again until February 12th, when they returned from their tour of Australia. Reading the enormous amount of press coverage gave us all quite a shock, since the newspaper and TV reports were filled with images of the two of them dancing and laughing together at every opportunity. "'Something strange is going on here,' said Patty one morning as he sat at the large kitchen table. "'They've obviously had a good speaking to by someone and been told to put on a good show.' Paul agreed, looking aghast at the daily pictures of the couple apparently so much in love. But he added, "'Well, maybe something's changed between them. One thing is for sure. We'll know the truth when they get back.' Ah, oh, yes, this momentary blip of bliss is not to last. Their first weekend of the new year together was a revelation, and certainly something seemed to be much calmer between them. They were still in separate rooms at night, but the tension and dark atmosphere of the previous year appeared to have lifted. The tone of voice used when they called each other darling in front of the staff seemed altogether sweeter and more genuine than in previous months, and as a result, William and Harry behaved much better. William, by now, was old enough to be aware of the rows and tensions in his parents' marriage. No amount of play-acting can ever fool a child. However, as he sat down to breakfast that February morning with Charles and Diana, he must have seen his parents as an altogether closer unit. Charles, who the previous year had sent his elder son back to the nursery for his breakfast after a series of particularly noisy and badly behaved mealtimes, now cooed softly as William, the wombat, as he dubbed him, accidentally spilt yogurt over his chair. Diana looked anxiously across at her husband as William giggled at the mess and was surprised and pleased at the change in him. That would be different, wouldn't it? If you'd been sort of snapped at and sent upstairs and now suddenly your dad's, you know, okay with it and sort of laughing and just making light of it. What a relief. You know, I've, of, I've often thought what a gift it is to give to a child when you could be upset with them and you aren't. It's like the surprise of that is such a relief when you're a little kid. They might still not have a lot in common, said Paul as he filled up another coffee pot for them that morning, but I do think things might be a bit more peaceful from now on. The staff was quite overcome by the sense of domestic bliss, even if the prince and princess spent much of the day apart. Despite his heavy workload, Charles never prevented the boys from going into any of the rooms, and quite often seemed to welcome their intrusion if he was in the middle of some boring paperwork. When he needed absolute peace and quiet, he would ask them to play outside for an hour, and then promise them a game of Big Bad Wolf upstairs later on. This was one of the boys' favorite pastimes. It consisted of Charles standing in the middle of the day nursery floor and trying to prevent them getting past him. Sometimes it got quite rough, with little William and Harry being hurled onto the large sofa at the side, although nobody ever got hurt because of all the cushions. Invariably, they were prevented from passing, and amid gales of laughter were sent spinning to the sofa. "'Look at the mess, Wendy,' said an exhausted Charles as the boys were being tucked up in bed. "'Come on, I'll give you a hand putting everything back in its place.' Isn't that so lovely and normal of Charles to play this big bad wolf game? Like, every dad does that. Every dad loves to roughhouse with his kids. And, and we've been painted this picture of Charles as somebody who's too busy working, too busy thinking about the planet, too busy playing polo even to think about his boys. Like, you know, he's not upstairs throwing them across the nursery playing big bad wolf. And yet he is. And I just, and, 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 and not even that, but the fact that when they're done, and the whole nursery's a wreck. He jumps in with the housekeeper and helps her to straighten things up. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> he's still my heart. You know, I just, I love that side of Charles. And truly, that's the side of him that we got from Spare, despite Harry's protestations. So I really think that he is genuinely a super kind man on, in many respects. And that Charles and Diana were just this faded couple that were never going to make it because they were just so completely different and just read each other all wrong. And I don't know if it's just because of the age be difference between them. I don't know if Diana's mind was just set spinning against him because of the Camilla thing early on. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it was her bulimia that her, made her emotionally irregular. I don't know if she like truly had a mental illness that made her unable to comprehend what was going on around her in any actual real sense. I don't know. Something happened between them that made her completely unable to, to read his signals and to read him as a person. But I think that at the end of the day, he was actually quite a lovely person, even if there are times when I think he was a little bit off-putting because he had been spoiled his whole life, honestly, and that sometimes he could be a little bit temperamental. But I mean, we all have our faults. I think all of us would be a little bit temperamental if we'd had everything handed to us our whole life. 
All right. The book goes on to say that everything's going lovely. It's all fine, really. But tragedy, true tragedy is about to strike. The book says that it was just before dinner on Thursday, March 10th. At home in Form B, I was on the verge of taking a joint out of the oven when the telephone rang. It was Paul, the butler at Highgrove. Wendy, thank God I've reached you, he spluttered. There's been the most terrible accident in Switzerland. The boss and the princess are fine, thank goodness, but Major Hugh Lindsay, you know the equerry is dead. You'd better get back here as soon as you can. I turned on the evening news and to my horror saw pictures of the avalanche that had come so close to taking the prince's life. Only two days previously, Charles and Diana had flown off to Clouster's with a group of friends, including the Duchess of York. Both had seemed relaxed and very much looking forward to the break. Then on the Thursday, disaster struck. Although Diana and Sarah, who was pregnant at the time, had been resting in their chalet, Charles, his friends, Mr. and Mrs. Palmer Tompkinson, Hugh Lindsay, and a ski guide, Bruno Sprechter, were caught up in the avalanche. And when the snow and boulders had passed, Major Lindsay was dead and Mrs. Patty Palmer Tompkinson badly injured. I knew practically everyone in the group, and I felt a great wave of shock come over me. It had been so close. The accident could so very nearly have changed the entire course of history, leaving young William and Harry without a father. I hastily gave my children some supper, and I jumped in my car to make the four-hour drive back to Highgrove. The prince returned to the house on Saturday. Diana had chosen to go back to Kensington Palace with Sarah and Hugh Lindsay's widow. Dressed in black, Charles walked through the sitting room. His face was ashen, and he looked as if he had not slept for days. "'I'm so terribly sorry, sir,' I said as he walked up to greet me. "'It's been the most terrible few days, I'm afraid, Wendy,' he replied. That weekend, the arrangements were made for Hugh Lindsay's funeral. Charles seemed to be suspended in a state of shock. There were numerous phone calls from the Queen, Prince Andrew, and Prince Edward. Charles took them all in his study and wrote letters of sympathy to Hugh's family and widow. "'He's blaming himself for what happened, you know,' said Paul, that evening after he had taken in a light supper tray, hardly any of which was touched. He's sitting there watching television, with a completely blank look on his face. It's as if he can't comprehend quite what's happened. Diana obviously felt her place was in London, near Sarah Lindsay and Fergie. However, we considered her non-appearance at Highgrove sadly indicative of how little the couple shared, even at times of grief. This is very odd. You know things have completely unraveled, when in the face of the death of a friend on a vacation that you're taking with him, you don't come to your husband's aid, you don't come to his side, and he doesn't come to yours, and the two of you just grieve separately and in silence. And the worst of it is that, you know, at least Diana put herself in the vicinity of Fergie and the widow, you know, so that they could sort of be with each other in their grief. But it seems that no one cared that Charles was also grieving this. And I don't know if Charles sort of pulled away because that was the way he wanted it, if he wanted to be alone, or if there just was nobody there who bothered themselves about how he was dealing with it. The book says that Charles appeared at times on the verge of breaking down in tears. I think the realization of how close he'd been to death affected him far more than he acknowledged. But there was nobody there to comfort him and talk things over apart from his detectives and staff, whom he would not usually have burdened with such private matters. As he went up to his room that evening, I saw a very lonely man climbing the stairs. His family, devoted to duty, carried on with their public engagements. Diana was in London with William and Harry. But Charles was at Highgrove, alone. Can you even fathom, even at the worst points that you've ever had with your spouse when you two are just really getting on each other's nerves, if you had been on a vacation together with family friends and your husband had almost died in an avalanche and one of his friends did, one of your mutual friends did die, and that you would just go your separate ways, you to one city, he, you know, 90 miles away in his country home, and you guys are just... Like, it doesn't even occur to you to reach out, to be together. And what's even wilder is that so many times when things are not well in a couple's relationship, tragedy or grief from the outside can put them back together again. You know, you, you, you find solace in each other. Things have really gone to the dogs when you don't even consider that this would be the time when you might sort of bridge the gap that has been created. You don't try to show up. You're not like, hey, you know, things haven't been great between us, but, you know, 
can can we like sleep together in the same bed tonight? I'm sad and lonely and you know, it really scared me about what happened. Doesn't even enter their pretty little heads. This is wild behavior and truly the sign that it's over. The book says that the avalanche and its tragic results had wiped out much of the newfound goodwill between Diane and her husband. Both the prince and princess needed people to help them grieve and come to terms with the loss, yet neither could turn to the other. The tragedy affected the rest of their lives in several ways, since it appeared to spell the end of any mutual support. Charles and Diana seemed to reach a truce of equal indifference that summer. No longer were there the bitter rows and recriminations of earlier years, but neither was there the spontaneous attempts to make up. In the past, a particularly nasty scene might have been followed by an attempted reconciliation. But now, neither seemed the slightest bit interested in what the other was doing. In front of the boys, they were civil and polite. But when the children were in bed, there was practically no communication whatsoever. Diana had given up her quest for a tennis court, but had miraculously found another pastime to fill her spare moments. And it was a hobby that took us all, including Patty, by surprise. She had seen how much William and Harry enjoyed their pony rides, and suddenly announced that she intended to take up riding herself. I'm suspicious about that excuse, and what a convenient one, too. To say, the boys are really enjoying all the riding, and I don't intend to just sit back and not join them when they're having so much fun. And since Charles won't build me a tennis court, I might as well do whatever you country people do, and it seems to be riding horses. So I'll join in. Please. We all know the real reason she did, and the book will expound on the real reason she decided to take up the hobby, but what a limp excuse, and how dumb does she think all these people really are? And that's the real offensive thing here. They think the staff is either too stupid to know what's going on, or if they know that the staff is aware that it's going on, they think the staff has no business having any moral compunction against it and send them on errands like Charles did to be like, hey, could you bring this stuff to Camilla? I'd like her to have these chocolates, these flowers, these vegetables. Later, bring her a dog. I mean, it's all of these gifts and things. And who's going to do that? Who's going to bring that? The staff? It's just, it's obnoxious. But anyway, she floats that lame excuse out there that, William and Harry are really enjoying riding, so I might as well. Patty's reaction had been suitably scathing. After the initial shock of hearing her express an interest in something he considered exclusively to be the prince's and his sort's interest, he remarked, It won't last. She's too bloody weak and timid to be able to handle a horse. I'll give her a month and she'll give up. However, he was wrong. See, I don't think that's the right reaction, Patty. I don't think that's the right reaction at all. She can't take it up because she's never had an interest at all in it. And so now her wanting to get involved isn't because she wants to get closer to her husband, which honestly would have been a noble pursuit, but because she wants to get close to a different man. And I think if I were Charles, I would be incredibly put out, which we'll find that he was. Let me turn the page here. I'm fighting desperately against these pages. Even though she never did any riding at Highgrove, she would stop off on her way down to ride out with a new friend, who was also teaching the boys. How odd that you wouldn't bother to ride at Highgrove when it's your boys that you say inspired and they ride every Sunday at Highgrove. What an interesting turn of events. The new riding instructor had obviously made quite an impression on Diana, who would chat away happily to the boys about their trotting and cantering and how much they'd improved. He was a handsome, copper-haired cavalry officer called James Hewitt, with his perfect manners and easygoing charm, he seemed to be ideal for the young princes. They liked him so much that before long, they were asking if he could come and stay at weekends. Diana readily agreed, betraying a warmth and depth of affection between her and the riding instructor that surprised everybody. James' visits were at first sporadic, and he would arrive for the odd night when the prince was away. He joined in happily with the staff's routine, and would often be found chatting with William and Harry in the kitchen as they cut up the food for the rabbits and fed the goldfish. The air of relaxed domesticity between Diana and James should have set alarm bells ringing to anyone with their interests at heart. It was obvious that a mutual infatuation was taking them in very dangerous directions. Oh, James, you're spoiling them rotten, she giggled as he handed out the tin of royal biscuits to the staff in the kitchen. Come on outside for a walk and let them get on with the lunch. We watched with concern as Diana led him out and onto the terrace, her face colored and excited by his visit. So Diana's got her own special friend now, just like the prince, chuckled Chris Barber, one of the chefs. I suppose it could only have been expected. I grew bothered by the frequency of James's visits and dreaded the prince asking me a direct question about him. I would not know what to say. I thought Diana could not be keeping the visits a secret because of the boys being there. They were bound to have mentioned him. 
For the moment, I decided I would treat the whole matter as a gentle infatuation, at least until there was evidence to the contrary. It'd be another twelve months before that was to happen. That summer, Charles threw himself into his polo with a vigor and passion that surprised even Patty. He's pushing himself too hard, he said one day. It's as if he feels under pressure to prove his riding skills. I don't know what's got into the man. But we did. He was discovering how close his wife was growing to another polo player, Major James Hewitt, and he did not like the air of competition one bit. Meanwhile, Charles' nocturnal visits to Camilla continued as before, with the prince snatching as much time as possible with the brigadier's wife. The prince would often drive a staff car when visiting Camilla and other friends in the area, and rarely his Aston Martin. Arrangements and dinner dates were hurriedly cancelled and rearranged at the last minute. The royal train, originally booked for departure at 11 p.m., was changed to 2 a.m. on the morning of June the 2nd. "'Why does he want the train so late?' I innocently asked when told of the change of plan. "'He wants to go out for dinner,' said Paul, "'and he's going to be out for some time.'" <laughs> Interesting. Uh, this is the wildest world, and, you know, I have nothing new to add to this whole storyline of the James Hewitt on the one hand with Diana, and then Camilla on the other hand with Charles. It's just, it's not a world we can understand. It just seems so contrary to obvious happiness that I don't understand why everyone is thrashing around wondering why they're so unhappy. Duh! You're not happy because you're cheating and lying and, and behaving in dishonest ways. How could you be happy when you're being dishonest? It's completely contrary to a peaceful existence to be living a lie. And I know they've sort of like reached this consensus where you do you and I'll do me, but that's not really how, you can't really do that. Because even though Charles knows that he's cheating on Diana with Camilla, he can't help but still recognize that Diana's his wife and that she has eyes for this, you know, James Hewitt. And in response to that, he's riding himself to death on the polo field because he feels this competition with this man who has taken the love of his wife and who is getting every sweetness she has to offer when he has been given anything but bitter viper venom for the last several years. So it just seems to me that while these people seem to have been able to delude themselves into thinking that I know you're cheating on me and I'm cheating on you and we'll just sort of go our separate ways, they aren't really able to divorce themselves from the sense that this person who I call my spouse owes me something. Charles feels that Diana owes him loyalty, otherwise he wouldn't be so mad and angry that she's given it to somebody else. And the thing is, she does. But the same could be said for him. So it, it doesn't matter what you tell yourself. It doesn't matter if you are able to lie with words to yourself. Your soul and your heart knows better. And you will always find yourself on a cellular level reacting to morality, whether you tell yourself that you have a new set of morals or not. Morally speaking, Diana owes him loyalty, and morally speaking, he owes Diana loyalty. So they're never going to be able to get over their jealousy that it's not happening in their marriage because their very souls know better. Okay, the book says that it was Diana's 27th birthday, and Highgrove is overflowing with staff and children. Diana, Ev, and Ruth Wallace, the nanny, all arrived in high spirits on the Friday afternoon, and the boys headed straight for the swimming pool. Diana, looking radiant in cotton trousers and a flower top, rushed into the house with carrier bags full of presents. I had put a wonderful bunch of tulips in her room, and she thanked me for them in the card I'd sent to Kensington Palace the day before. It was going to be a relaxed family weekend, she said, and she'd arranged for William and Harry to have Ella, Prince and Princess Michael's daughter, little Gabrielle Kent, whom she adored to play with. That night, Charles returned with Colin Trimming, his detective, from an engagement in Scotland for a special birthday dinner prepared by Enrico, their charismatic new Italian pasta chef. Okay, okay, okay. Before I read this story, I'm going to tell you right now, I do not get the joke at the end of it. I don't get it. I don't know if it's that I'm not pronouncing something right, so I don't hear the joke. I don't know what it is. Please explain it to me. Because I read it multiple times, and I didn't get it. So, I don't know if it's just ignorance on my part. Completely possible. But whatever it is, please tell me. Okay. The book says that this Italian pasta chef had quickly discovered the prince's likes and dislikes and introduced him to the idea of having crudités before a meal with a mayonnaise or tomato dip. There was also parma ham cut from sides stored in the pantry. Charles grew so fond of this dish that he went completely overboard and asked for it before every dinner. 
On days when it was late appearing, we would get a call in the pantry with Charles saying in a mock, angry growl, Where's the bloody crudités? The joke on the word crudité amusing him to no end. I don't get it. Is it like... Isn't it an innuendo I don't get? Is it like... I don't get the joke. <laughs> I want to get the joke. I don't get the joke. Do you get the joke? Help me. The birthday supper that night was quite civilized, with both Charles and Diana retiring early to bed and to their separate rooms. Diana took some late-night phone calls from friends, but was asleep by midnight. She had said from the start that she did not want a fuss made, and Charles had gone along with her wishes. I get so exhausted, Wendy, she explained early the next day. I can barely keep my eyes open after 10 p.m. With Charles due to play polo, Diana, Ella, William, and Harry went off to visit Bowwood House, owned by one of the prince's close friends, the Earl of Shelburne. It was later said to be a secret meeting place for Charles and Camilla. Diana, however, seemed oblivious to the house's significance and looked upon the visit as a treat for the children. Unfortunately, there was an accident. Ella fell from a climbing frame and broke her collarbone. She was suffering from concussion and had to be rushed to hospital. Ruth, who had been Ella's nana before working for the prince and princess, went to the hospital with her, staying the night to comfort the frightened little girl. This meant that Ev and I had to look after Harry the following day while Diana took William to Polo. Harry was most miffed about not being able to see his father play. Diana looked at me exasperatedly. Well, you know the problems, don't you, Wendy? The place would be overrun with press, and without Ruth to keep control of the boys, they'd start a riot. That's the last thing I need at the moment. She looked quietly at her younger son. Don't worry, darling. Let's ask James to teach you about polo the next time we see him. Harry looked up and smiled, mirroring the expression on his mother's face. I don't like that. You're literally going to go see your dad play polo. The man knows a thing or two about the sport. He only spends like 95% of his time worrying about it and playing it. And then you have the audacity to tell your son, I'm sorry I can't go this time, but don't worry. When we see James next, I'll have him tell you all about polo. And he'll teach you all about it. And he'll tell you all the things you want to know. And maybe he can teach you some of the most intricate plays. Uh, or... What about this for a bright idea? You could just ask the kid's dad. What the heck, Diana? Okay, chapter 9, The Dog and the Duchess. This is a short chapter, but let's get into it. We get some really weird stories about what Sarah was up to. She's an oddball, I'm sorry to say. She's not normal. And her behavior since she's become a duchess has just escalated negatively to the extreme. And the disdain that we read dripping from Wendy earlier when she discussed Andrew and Fergie has only heightened. Because now it's not just that Fergie is sort of dumpy and shows up with dirty underwear to be washed by the staff. But now that she's climbed up in the social ladder, she really is going to get that staff hopping for her. But she's just crude... You know, they continue to use this term earthy, but what they really mean is that she has zero social skills, that she is rude and entitled, that she's odd, and that she just sort of stomps through life with no grace whatsoever. Wendy is no great fan. Let's read chapter nine. Okay, so the chapter begins by saying, a heavily pregnant redhead stood puffing and out of breath at the front door, her cheeks covered in beads of sweat. Hiya, boomed Fergie, brushing past Paul and walking into the sitting room. Is the prince around? Behind her walked her lady-in-waiting Helen Hughes, her head slightly bowed as she struggled under the weight of several overnight bags. Unlike her friendship with Diana, which was beginning to cool, Sarah's relationship with Charles seemed to be growing closer by the week. She'd ring up and ask his advice on the most trifling of things, ranging from polo matters to which charity she should try to become involved with. Get us some tea, will you? She called of no one in particular when told the prince was due back at 6 p.m. Helen and I are gasping for a cup. Paul and I exchanged worried glances. We were both envisioning a busy stay. Since her marriage to Andrew, Sarah Ferguson had changed no end from a rather frumpy Sloan into a very demanding young madam. I looked at her brand new, smart, very expensive luggage and smiled at the contrast with the battered old plastic suitcases she had had before her marriage. She was obviously loving every moment of her newfound importance as a duchess and was going to be a stickler for detail. That woman, said Paul through gritted teeth as we narrowly missed kicking Bendix, Sarah's dog, on our way through to the kitchen to prepare the tea tray. 
When Charles arrived, he rushed through to greet them, showing a genuine warmth and humor rarely bestowed on his wife. Charles! shrieked Sarah as he walked through the door. How brilliant to see you! That evening, the prince, the duchess, and her lady in waiting all ate together in the sitting room. Diana was away and not due for another forty eight hours. The sound of laughter rang through Highgrove. Though heavily pregnant with her elder daughter Beatrice, Sarah was still in fine form and cracking raucous jokes at everyone's expense until well past eleven p.m. All right. Uh, if you'll notice, I've given Sarah a very annoying American accent, but that's because I feel that she takes up those characteristics. And I would like you to just take a deep breath for a minute because we're going to read an odd story. It's odd for all the weirdest reasons. It isn't odd because it's like devious or perverse. It's just weird. It's a weird story. And something is like not connecting in Sarah's head. Something is like who would do this? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I guess people do weird things when they're on their own, but this is odd, especially when you know somebody's going to come in early in the morning and bring you a tray of food. You just might mind your P's and Q's if you didn't know who was going to bust up any moment into the room. The other thing that's funny about the story is the way Wendy tells it. And she does not mince words or try to soften the blow whatsoever in the mental picture she's going to give you. Okay. So the book says, I was expected to take up an early morning tray and pack the Duchess's things the following day. As I walked along the landing, I could hear the sound of barking and giggling from her room. Knocking gently, I walked in and was confronted with one of the most preposterous sights I have ever seen. Lying on her back like a beached whale and with her nightdress up around her breasts, the Duchess of York was balancing Bendix on her massively swollen belly. With only a month to go before the birth, Fergie's tummy was huge an almost impossible mountain for Bendix to climb. As I walked in, she was balancing the dog on top of her and roaring with laughter, the terrier yapping and barking as she pulled at his legs to keep it in position. Oh, good morning, she blushed violently, tossing Bendix to one side and pulling the sheets over as she heard me come in. Just put it down on the side there, please. I looked at her case and I asked if she wanted me to press anything. Uh, I shouldn't think so, she said initially and then changed her mind. Oh, well, come to think of it, give all the once over, will you? I stared in horror at the two bags filled with blouses and maternity clothes. All of it, ma'am? I responded. Yes, she said firmly, all of it. She only said that because she was embarrassed that she was walked in on uh, playing some kind of weird game with her dog, balancing on her belly. You know, that's kind of like a, I don't know what scenario that is, but I think I'd be a little bit embarrassed if somebody saw me just playing these weird games um, with my clothes all hiked up around my breasts. Kind of odd. Uh, so that's why she decided to exercise her power over Wendy, because she felt that Wendy had one up on her, so she decided to one up Wendy by telling her to iron all the clothes in the suitcases, which is stupid because she was going that same day. So why are we ironing all the clothes that are just going to get folded and put back in? I don't know, but Sarah has many a power play that she likes to use. The book goes on to say that Fergie, by now dressed in an exquisitely ironed maternity suit, spoke quietly and confidentially with the prince for a few minutes before joining Helen in the car. It'll be all right. I know it will, Charles, she said softly as they stood alone together. These things just take time. Then with a kiss and a curt, bye, to Paul and me, she waddled to the car and drove away. The next day, Diana arrived very late with no nanny or dresser. Charles had already gone to bed and was up and off to polo before Diana surfaced at breakfast. Neither spoke to the other that weekend since Harry and his mother were in bed whenever Charles eventually returned. On Sunday, Diana went back to London in tears, her face hidden by a baseball cap brim. Dashing out through the back door, she was so upset she could not even say goodbye. I looked at Paul and I wondered what on earth had happened to cause such a scene. Diana's phone had gone non-stop during her stay, but there had not been any of the usual rows or niggles. Problems in London? suggested Paul. No doubt we'll find out sooner or later. The constant mood swings, which took Diana from delirious happiness to despair, were turning into an irritating and confusing pattern for all the staff. None of us knew quite what to expect when she arrived for the weekend stopovers either with or without the nursery. So it came as no real surprise when after months of tears and indifference, Charles and Diana arrived for their seventh wedding anniversary at Highgrove looking as happy as newlyweds. I'd filled the rooms with cut flowers and both the prince and princess seemed overwhelmed by their scents and colors. How romantic Charles look, said Diana as she pointed to an enormous bunch of wild roses on the piano in the hall. That weekend, Charles and Diana and their son sat together at mealtimes and relaxed by the pool during the hot summer afternoons. They were a picture of domestic contentment, lounging around in swimsuits and toweling robes and ringing through for jugs of lemon refresher. 
and as always, their mood was infectious. Charles and Diana actually chased each other around the pool at one stage, both ending up falling in to the delight of William and Harry. The boys were due to stay with us for a week and spent the days running around in shorts, swimming and riding and firing their water pistols at anyone who came within range. Both were brimming with excitement about the holidays in Majorca and spent hours discussing what they were going to do there when they arrived. With the royals away most of the summer, either in Spain or up in Scotland, Paul and I set about giving Highgrove an annual clean. As in previous years, it was Charles who made chief overnight stays to check on the operation, taking a delight in even the most minor altercations and subtle changes of paint. New mobile telephones were delivered from the palace, along with instructions that, in the light of the various taped conversation scandals, now seem extremely ironic. Although we were told that they were more expensive to use than landlines, the real concern appeared to be over security. One memo underlined the risk, pointing out, quote, speech on mobile phones is not just insecure, it is very easy to intercept. Of course, none of us quite knew how easy until tapes of the prince's and princess's intimate conversations were published in the newspapers. As autumn approached, there was more visitors to Highgrove, including Diana's mother, Frances Shan Kidd, Sarah Lindsay with her baby, Alice, and Princess Beatrice with her nanny. Diana was absolutely bowled over by her niece and took William and Harry up to see her. She was at her most natural with young babies, and flushed excitedly she held the tiny child in her arms. She fussed over little Alice, too, as if she was never going to drag herself away from the child. There was an unspoken bond between Diana and Mrs. Lindsay following the avalanche. No matter what happened, she or Charles would always look after her. Sarah Lindsay herself was remarkably calm and composed, taking solace in the fact that Hugh's baby was alive and well, even if Hugh was not there himself. Bruno Sprecher, the friend of Fergie's, who had acted as ski guide that day, also spent an October weekend with Diana and Charles. He turned up looking extremely dapper in a sharp jacket and jeans, his beard neatly trimmed along tidy geometric lines. Charles and Diana later explained they felt it important that he come over and stay in case he blamed himself for the accident. Both the prince and princess were polite and welcoming to him, but it didn't appear to be the same depth of friendship between them and the ski guide as between him and Fergie. Fergie's nanny, Alison Wardley, who turned up in a miniskirt, was much younger than I had expected, and was extremely open and friendly with the staff. Everyone was interested in finding out what life was like with the Duchess, and some of those who had worked at Buckingham Palace with Andrew wanted to know if he had changed. Alison expertly fielded the personal questions, but her observation that Fergie, quote, could be really quite difficult, like anyone, appeared to be the tip of the iceberg. After the problems of previous years, Diana seemed resigned to the differences between her and Charles's characters and more in control of her emotions. She appeared more mature and confident than I had ever seen her before, and single-minded about what she wanted out of life. They did not sleep together, at least not at Highgrove, but seemed to have come to terms with their lot. The strange thing was that we knew Charles was still visiting Camilla, although by this stage she did not come so frequently to Highgrove, and Diana was spending a lot of time with her friend James Hewitt. But tempers and emotions had cooled enough in their marriage to allow balance and consequently a calmer atmosphere at home. Yeah, because they don't care enough anymore. Like, who, who, honestly, their, their uh, attitude right now is, I don't care what you do. There's not enough in my heart left over for you that I need to be upset that you're seeing Camilla. And there's not enough left in my heart to be upset that you're seeing James. So, you know, it's not a deep comment, but when people stop fighting, they've also stopped loving. Because if you no longer care to get into the fray and you just are going to let life just sort of pass you by, and you're going to be a passive observer in your own relationship, then you are no longer a participant in it. And if you're not a participant in it, then you will find that you are now no longer in a relationship at all. So this is sort of the stage that they're in at this point. The weather had now turned and Charles, dressed in cords in an old heavy woolen sweater, sat alone at breakfast. It was, November, it was November 14th, and he'd woken up to the realization that he was 40 years old. A neat pile of presents had been laid out on a table by his valet. Among small packages and cards was a little present. Some little blue pills. They were from the police post outside, and inside the box was a jokey card suggesting they might come in useful now that he was heading towards old age. The prince laughed, but looked more depressed than for several months. He had the air of a deeply sad man, whose youth had somehow slipped past him without him realizing it. "'Does it hit everyone a bit like this?' he asked Ken the valet the next morning. "'I didn't expect it to be quite so bad.' As if to make matters worse, Diana came downstairs at her most playful. "'Morning, darling. What does it feel like to be so old?' she joked. The main Christmas staff ball that year was at Buckingham Palace, and I had arranged for an old friend to come with me. As Joe Loss and his orchestra struck up the first dance— 
Prince Philip approached a lady member of the staff and asked for a dance. Fergie was there with Prince Andrew, and I noticed she was coming in our direction, a broad grin on her face. As she bounced up to us, I began to introduce my guest. A look of confusion furrowed her brow. "'Well, who on earth are you?' she barked somewhat officiously. I explained I'd looked after her at Highgrove. "'Oh, yeah,' she replied aloofly. "'So you did,' and walked away. (laughs) "'What?' (laughs) I was not angry so much for myself as for my guest. Are they always that rude? He asked me. Your life must be a misery. And that is the end of those two chapters. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. What is this that we are reading? This is crazy. This is insane to me. How can Fergie be this rude and weird and odd? I mean, this is truly a life spent without understanding anything. She doesn't understand anything, not even a little bit. She doesn't understand the basic and simple principles of getting along with another human being. You know, you might not be book smart. You might not know a lot of things about the way the world works. But it is not difficult to figure out how to interact with another human because you are one. Consider what you would want done, then do the same to your neighbor. It's like the easiest formula of all time to get along in the world. How would those words make you feel? Okay, then don't say them. Is it a lie? Don't say it. Is it wrong? Don't do it. I mean, it's not hard to figure out how to be a pleasant person with others. It's just, do you want to be? And clearly she didn't. So people can say all they want. Oh, you know, Fergie was just dumpy and dumb and, you know, stupid and all this. I don't hold that against anyone. You know, we we all have our different levels of intellect. But being a human being, all you have to do is look into your own heart and figure out what do I want? What do I want from other people around me? What would be meaningful for me? And if I can figure that out, I can figure out what's meaningful for them. It's, It's not rocket science, but apparently it was too much for Fergie. All right, the next time we come together, we're going to read two chapters, one called Staff Confidences, and we're going to get some more of Diana just ripping into poor Evelyn, her dresser. And then the next chapter is called Separate Lives. So more of the same, but many, many different hues and colors of that same thing. It's wild. We're also going to talk about, which I wasn't like, I didn't have this on my bingo card for the book. We're going to talk about the... uh, rampant homosexuality that was within the staff and how Diana was afraid that AIDS was going to take them all out. So that was an interesting conversation. (laughs) I look forward to reading that to you next time we come together. Uh, Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.